Although nowadays the Terran Basin seems like any other desert, in ancient times it used to harbour a myriad of Greek city-states. Amongst them, there was one so intriguing that it went from being a dominant city to a ghost town in the space of a few decades. Our story begins in the Eurasian steppe, the home of the ancient nomadic Indo-European people. The Indo-Europeans, being nomadic, were keen migrators, and it was for a long time hypothesised that these people migrated into the Terran Basin in northwestern China by 1800 BCE. This hypothesis was formed due to the presence of light-haired mummies in the region, although recent genetic study has debunked this claim by showing that in actuality, these mummies belong to the ancient North Eurasian people, an isolated group who share some DNA with modern-day native Siberians and Native Americans. Due to this, and the fact that Indo-Europeans were definitely present in the Terran Basin by the term of the Common Era, we have little idea of when the Indo-Europeans actually moved into this region. What we do know is that by 176 BCE, they were being written about by the Chinese and their sphere of influence, with the Shan Yu of the Xiongnu Confederacy sending a letter to the Han Emperor detailing his conquest of the Indo-European cities. In addition, we have conquered the Lulan, Wu Sun and Hu Ji tribes, as well as 26 states nearby, so that all of them have become part of the Xiongnu nation. These tribes, as the Xiongnu Shan Yu calls them, were in fact city-states, and their inhabitants became known as Tacarians. Although the basin is mostly barren, as it is mostly covered by the Taklamakan Desert, these Tacarians would establish their cities alongside the river shores that flowed from the mountain ranges that surrounded the region. Glacial melting would supply these communities with fresh water, which their inhabitants exploited by creating oases and building vast irrigation systems around their cities, making agriculture and life sustainable in such a harsh climate. Some of these rivers would flow into the desert, where they would evaporate into the arid landscape. Others, however, would discharge into a lake by the name of Lop Nur. Here, one would find the ancient kingdom of Lulan, the subject of his video. Known by its inhabitants as Kroran, Lulan was not the biggest of the Tacarian cities. That honour was reserved for Kuksha, a city located in the northwestern parts of the basin. Lulan, however, is known for its far more tumultuous history. During the late 2nd century BCE, the Han Emperor Wu, after hearing the reports of one of his envoys, wished to extend contact with the Daiyuan, a Greek state in the Fagana Valley of Central Asia. As such, he sent a couple of expeditions to this kingdom. These, however, would not reach their destination, as they were harassed by Lulan and other cities along their route. This infuriated the Emperor, who, consequently, sent an army to conquer the region in 108 BCE. With its king captured, Lulan agreed to pay tribute to the Chinese. Upon hearing of these events, their previous overlords, the Xiongnu, ordered another attack on Lulan. Seeing himself between a rock and a hard place, the king of Lulan sent two of his sons as hostages to placate his neighbours, one to the Xiongnu and the other to the Han court. However, upon discovering Lulan's dealings with the Xiongnu, the infuriated Chinese acted harshly, as described in the Book of Han. The emperor commanded Zhen Wen to lead the troops by a suitable route, to arrest the king of Lulan and to bring him to the palace at the capital city. Zhen Wen interrogated the king by presenting him with a bill of indictment which he answered by claiming that Lulan was a small state lying between large states, and that unless it subjected itself to both parties, there would be no means of keeping itself in safety. He therefore wished to remove his kingdom and to take up residence within the Han territory. This tradition of sending their princes to the Han court continued. However, under Xiongnu orders, they also kept harassing Chinese envoys to the region. This lasted until 77 BCE, when the Han Emperor Zhao ordered a delegation to deceive and assassinate the Lulan king. Upon completing the deed, the envoy responsible for the regicide supposedly proclaimed, The Son of Heaven has sent me to punish the king by reason of his crime in turning against the Han. Han troops are about to arrive here, 
do not dare to make any move which would result in yourselves bringing about the destruction of your state. From this point onwards, the hand tightened their grip on Lulan, turning it into a full Chinese puppet state, symbolised by the forceful renaming of the kingdom to Shan Shan, although the city itself remained called Lulan. Together with the rest of the Terran Basin, it would become known as the Protectorate of the Western Regions. This, however, did not stop the Zhongnu from heavily contesting the region well into the 2nd century CE. With time, Shan Shan, laying on a key route that would form part of the Silk Road, would grow, conquering nearby cities into its dominion. The city of Lulan would, from this point onwards, be developed into an important centre of Buddhism, whose skyline was dominated by a massive stupa where the Shan Shan administration was probably located. Although politically a subject of China, Shan Shan was definitely more culturally inclined to the West. Woolen cloth imported from the Eastern Mediterranean could be found in the city, as well as frescoes depicting Hermes. This orientation to both West and East, not only characteristic of Lu Lan, but Shan Shan as a whole, was also reflected in its dual administrative structure. While the highest administrative and military bodies employed Chinese in their communications, the local authorities used Prakrit, an Indo-European language written in the Karoshti script, used by merchants and Buddhist monks. Although exact dates are unknown, the power of Shan Shan began to shift from Lulan to the cities of Miran and Charklik further upstream. Not long thereafter, a catastrophe was bound to happen. The tragic end of the city was about to begin. Lulan's survival was heavily dependent on its irrigation channels. In fact, all of the cities of the region were. The Chinese had introduced their agricultural methods in the region, massively boosting its agricultural outcome for decades to come. The locals, amazed by this new abundance of food, heavily employed these new farming methods all across the region, enhancing the risk even more as local, climate-attuned practices were abandoned. At first, this over-exploitation of natural resources wasn't seen as an issue. However, as the city's population grew, more and more farmland was needed, further putting a strain on the already scarce water resources of the region. This not only affected the water resources, but also the local vegetation. As more land was needed for farms, more and more vegetation was destroyed. By the 3rd century CE, this situation had grown so dire that the local authorities issued the two following decrees. Whoever fells a tree with its roots shall be fined one horse. It is forbidden to fell trees in their growing period. Offenders will be fined one cow. Nevertheless, these decrees would fail to stop the imminent catastrophe. Historical documents describe diminishing river discharges into the region after 270 CE. However, nowadays this is proved to be untrue. Access to the ice core record from the nearby Kunlun Mountains show us that the climate conditions were relatively wet at the end of the Han Dynasty. The issue lied entirely in the over-exploitation of the rivers. Since Lulan was located the furthest from the source of its river, the water scarcity was felt much more aggressively. The effects of over-exploitation on all the cities upstream were felt directly in Lulan. Due to a lack of fresh water, the lake on which shores Lulan was built upon, the Lop Ne, grew saltier by the day, further damaging the local ecosystem. Over time, the lake would dry up, forcing people to migrate upstream. Wooden tablets found in Lulan indicated that cultivation and irrigation lasted until at least 330 CE. This would be the last record of Lulan for over 1,500 years. In a matter of decades, one of the most prosperous settlements of the Tarim Basin now lay empty. In 645 CE, Zhuan Zhang, a Buddhist monk, upon passing a site believed to be Lulan wrote, A fortress exists, but not a trace of man. The Lulan disaster is not an isolated example. In fact, we can see similar catastrophes occurring even today. The prime example, sharing an uncanny set of circumstances, is that of the Aral Sea. This all began in the 1960s, when the government of the USSR began a massive irrigation project to divert the vast amounts of water from rivers that supplied the Aral Sea for use in cotton growing. This was by no means assisted by the fact that cotton requires a large amount of water to grow. The effect has been a massive reduction in the size of the Aral Sea, 
which in turn has led to unforeseen weather feedback, as the Aral Sea, once a weather regulator, can no longer act as such. This has led to large-scale health issues, affecting the lives of millions of Kazakhs, Uzbeks, and people far beyond the Aral Sea. Let's avoid repeating this catastrophe again in the future. Special thanks to our Imperator level patron, Fernando Lopez Oyeda. As always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more great historical content. Feel free to follow our social media or join our Discord server, linked in the description below. And if you're feeling extra generous, why not become a patron and subscribe to our page on there.